Hi guys, I got a nice quick one for you on this 2004 Volvo VC40 and it's the 1.9 liter turbo. This car has got some issues. Um, I would love to make a video on kind of the main problem. It's um, stalling and then occasionally it's a no start after heat soak. But you know what, it's, it's so random getting it to act up. I don't know what the conclusion is. So we'll just make a quick video on one quick aspect I wanted to share. Um, if you've seen any of my other videos, you'll probably get an idea that I quite like this guy, the in-cylinder pressure transducer. I use it a lot and I find it tells me a lot and it's super quick to do, especially on a four cylinder like this. So let me show you the codes. Um, so what do we got? We got the a code 61 says ECM 61 reset valve camshaft faulty signal and we got a long-term fuel trim lean we got an oxygen sensor issue uh, another reset valve camshaft um, we got a misfire we got MAF and torque reduction so those aren't the nicest codes so a quick trick with these kinds of vehicles a lot of Europeans um, if we go back read the codes in generic mode you'll get things that make a little more sense more what you're used to Let's see if we can't uh, put this up so we got a P0015B camshaft uh, over retarded uh, a P0131 auction sensor a P0014 uh, B camshaft over advanced uh, 302, 303, system 2 lean, mass airflow sensor circuit. Uh, we got another camshaft P0015, system 2 lean, 02, uh, P0014, again B camshaft and cylinders 2 and 3 misfires. So, what do we know? We got a whole bunch of codes for the B camshaft, which is exhaust camshaft. We got a bunch of codes for cylinder 2 and 3. If we look, we pull the covers off and we take a peek, we do see it is waste bar. So cylinders two and three are companion cylinders. So, hey, you know what? Makes sense if you got an issue on cylinders two or three, you're gonna have codes for both. We do see there's a lot of shiny parts here, including coils and sure enough, the wires and the plugs are new. The plug, uh, I pulled this guy out here for cylinder two. The plug was um, pretty dark, so indications that it's um, running rich in there. So, what I like to do, um, a quick little thing, just as I'm looking around, you know, a uh, in visual inspection can tell you a lot. And hopefully, hopefully you can kind of see some of that grossness on that belt. I don't know if I can get you in a better spot. It is very, very, very oily in there. To the point that it almost makes you scared to run the stupid thing. I'm kind of worried that that's probably not showing up very well on the camera. But, so you'll have to take my word for it. So, all those codes for B camshaft. Could it be that the belt jumped with all that oil? very well could be and if you look right there the solenoid uh, has been changed the actuator well I wonder why it's got codes for B camshaft exhaust but nothing for the intake older vehicles like this if you see one camshaft has a variable valve timing actuator on it but not the other then what that's going to tell you almost all the time I can't tell you 100% certainty it's all the time but I can pretty well I've never seen it otherwise the bank that has the variable valve timing actuator is going to have a position sensor the one that doesn't will not and sure enough if we come over here if we look at the end here of the intake uh, uh, the end of the intake camshaft there's no sensor if we look all along there's no sensor. Now, this might be a little harder to spot on the exhaust. Um, 
trying to turn you around a little bit. Right down there is the sensor for the exhaust camshaft. So only the exhaust has a sensor. So if we look, um, if we look at the, you know what? Let me get back to that. So we know there's only one position sensor. So of course it makes sense that we only have a code for the exhaust camshaft. So when I see codes like that, and I see misfire codes, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna throw that in cylinder pressure transducer in, and I wanna throw it in one of the cylinders that's misfiring. Makes sense because not only can you increase your chances of catching something, but it gives you a chance to look at the spark plug. And sure enough, we saw that the spark plug indicates that it is running rich. So with a quick uh, little setup, of putting the in-cylinder pressure transducer in there. Since this is a waste spark, you know, you, you pop out, um, hopefully the lighting's not too dark. Come on, you, know, you pop this guy out. Now, you need this spark, you need to give this spark somewhere to go. You don't just want to unplug the coil because then you're dropping two cylinders, you know, half of the engine. So I have a spark plug tester that I got rigged up to this lead. And it's the style that you can set your gap so at least it's got something to jump. Now, this here is the style that this, if I can do this one-handed, come on. All right, there we go. So this is the style where it pops in because the end of this tester, it has uh, the same kind of end as a spark plug. So it'll clip into there nice. And then as you can see, it takes a bit of force, come on, there we go. Takes a bit of force to come off. Now, if you're doing a coil and plug style and you need to give that spark somewhere to go, or say, you know, if this one didn't snap on, then what I do is I just wrap electrical tape around it to make sure it doesn't fall out. And then of course, this end here, you put uh, on ground somewhere, but you know what? We got an expensive piece of equipment there. It is slightly sensitive to um, that the huge magnetic fields and uh, radio interference and all that stuff. Not only can you potentially damage that, but more likely what you're going to do is you're going to add a whole bunch of noise to the signal. So what you want to do with this guy here, um, you know, I put like bungee cords and stuff. I want to get, because this is actually jumping a gap right here. This will be sparking. I want to make sure that's as far away from my test equipment as possible. And same thing with, you know, the the pressure transducer, I want to make sure that's rigged up somewhere so it's not going to be smashing against something and you know, just you know, take care of your equipment. It'll take care of you. So anyways, just with hooking that in there, what does that tell us? Well, let me show you. Let me bring you over to our computer screen. <clears throat> yeah, this car has turned out to be a mess. But anyways, I thought this was kind of neat. So this was my capture. I made a capture of the in-cylinder pressure transducer in blue. Uh, red is a voltage trace of a fuel injector. And green, uh, I had just one of these secondary pickups around one of the other firing wires. I actually had that around cylinder one here, one of the good cylinders. I can get that back in there if it'll do it. Come on. Don't want to forget about that. Tuck that guy under there. Yeah, so straighten that out a little bit later. Okay, so, so what I had was I had, you know, the in-cylinder in blue, um, red was around a fuel injector, and green was around that spark. So we'll zoom in here. We can ignore the fuel injector, we can ignore the spark. I'm just looking at our in cylinder. So we grab two nice events, like you so, can minimize this. So how does that look? Does that look bad? Does that look good? You tell me. If you've done a few of these, then you know what? It looks pretty normal. If you've done a ton of these and you're super observant, you might catch a minor thing that looks off just by looking at it. This is one of the things that I love about PicoScope. 
Some of the other computer-based scopes are starting to do this. I heard that the Autel one is starting to do this, but you don't see this on um, the scan tool-based lab scopes, or at least it's really hard to do. So we got cursors. So I can put the 720 cursor right here. I can put the 01 right there. Uh, what I also like to do is I also like to drag down a horizontal one, set it at zero. You probably still won't see it yet until I put the the partitions for the 180 and 360 and all that. So this is what I like to do for the horizontals. I like to put the one at zero and this one down here roughly in line with the two bottoms because I want to make sure that this pocket down here is roughly in line with this pocket down here. You don't want a, a variance. But when we go down to rulers, we put our four partitions. Now, if you're familiar with in cylinder pressure transducer, you can spot the baddie. This is our 180 mark. So this is where the piston's at bottom dead center. We see that's just where the exhaust valve is only starting to open. See that rapid rise? Now this is where the piston starts coming up again, but it would, if the exhaust valve didn't open, this all this stuff down here is in vacuum, by the way, this is our zero PSI mark, so this is atmospheric. So if the exhaust valve didn't open, then we would see a corresponding uh, curve like this one on the other side. But we see a rapid rise in pressure because it's being introduced to atmospheric pressure. All the exhaust gases are filling the, the vacuum in the cylinder. And that's happening just after bottom dead center or right around bottom dead center. It should be happening before bottom dead center. More importantly, here's 360. So here's where the piston comes all the way to the top. That's top dead center exhaust. We see, and then after that, the piston's coming down. We see we're still at atmospheric for a ways after top dead center. So the piston's already coming down, but instead of building a vacuum, we're still in atmospheric because the exhaust valve's still open. This captures at idle, by the way, on a, on a relatively cold start, or um, not cold, but definitely not a hot start. It had time to cool down. So the piston's coming down, the exhaust valve's still open, we're pulling exhaust gas back into the cylinder. That's EGR at idle. Never should have EGR at idle, uh, especially when an engine's not warm. So if we drag a vertical cursor over here, and you know what, let's say it's say somewhere around there, that's still above atmospheric. We don't know exactly where, because when you're in the exhaust, the exhaust valve is open, you, you, you will see little pulses, so we don't know exactly where the end of the pulse is or where it's just a, an exhaust pulse coming down. So let's go roughly there. So we see here it's at 378 degrees, 0.6, so it's roughly 20 degrees after top dead center that the intake valve finally starts to open and the exhaust valve finally starts to close. And as far as intake valve closing goes, that one's a little harder to spot. I'm going to say it's, you know, somewhere around here, um, you know, 590 degrees. That's it's a little later than, than normal. So if our intake valve opened early when our exhaust valve was still open, it would draw into a vacuum a little quicker. We would have... Um, atmospheric coming from the exhaust, but the the vacuum, being introduced to the vacuum of the intake manifold would overcome this a lot quicker than we see. So we know that right around here, as the exhaust valve is closing, the intake valve is opening. There's not overlap. So that tells me that both of these are late. They're both retarded. It's not a matter of variable valve timing, because again, <laughs> this would not happen uh, at idle. Um, it's not a matter of variable valve timing because if we had uh, the exhaust being late, then our intake would still be at the same time because our intake is not variable. Our intake is fixed. And we would see more of a vacuum earlier on. We would see a more, instead of a, a sharp uh, drop right here, 
as we're introduced to vacuum and it rapidly pulls down, we would see kind of more of a gentle kind of curve as the two are fighting each other. We don't see that. So both are retarded. So uh, let's go back to the vehicle and we will see that it makes total sense that both of these are retarded. Um, <laughs> and not just because it's a Volvo. Come on, guys. If you look at how close those camshafts are to each other, the sprockets, and you look to see how much that belt is curling around those suckers, yeah, it's gonna be hard. See, this one's not curled around as much on the exhaust. Um, whereas the intake is really wrapped around there. You know what? It's going to be hard for one of those to jump relative to the other. What's going to be a lot easier? Way down the yonder. I don't know if you'll be able to see that. The crankshaft sprocket. Kind of where all that oil is pooling. So just by a quick uh, five, ten minutes. No closer to five if you're familiar with them and you got stuff handy, just a quick amount of time, I can throw that pressure transducer in there, I can get my capture, and I can tell for 100% certainty that our belt is off, no ifs, ands, buts, I don't have to worry about setting it to top dead center compression for number one, I don't have to worry about checking out my my uh, timing marks, because obviously, you know, on the, the cams, that's nice and easy, they're up on top, but that crank way down there, not always as easy. So this is just one of the reasons why I love those things. You know what? You can find stuff like this super quick and then there's also lots of other goodies in there. You can tell that we don't have uh, issues with the valves when they're opening. They're opening properly. They're not burnt. We're building compression, all this sort of stuff. Uh, it's good stuff to have. It's good stuff if, you, if you're into that sort of thing. It's good stuff to, to use as much as you can, kind of gain as much familiar familiarity with it as you can to, to gain a better uh, um, familiarity with what the pockets should look like, what's normal for the hash in, in the various, you know, say the, the exhaust pulses and these, these first few intake pulses, what's normal, what's normal. So one of the things that I spotted right away just by dropping this, this bottom cursor down, normally, because the exhaust valve opens earlier than that, before the piston gets to bottom dead center, normally this ex intake here, which is referred to as expansion pocket, normally that's a little higher than the the bottom depths of our of our intake here, um, just because it doesn't reach fully down at bottom dead center before this exhaust valve opens. So you know what? If you got it. Uh, and you're set up and you can work with it, throw it in there, it's quick and easy, and it can tell you lots of stuff, and there's no ifs, ands, buts about it, there's no worrying about it, you never have to worry, you know, did a, a mark get rubbed off, did somebody um, put a sprocket on wrong, you know, sometimes those, uh, the if you're just looking at the harmonic balancer, where the paint marks are, sometimes those can kind of get shifted and, um, very often that happens, but weird stuff can happen. If you throw this in there and you see that sort of stuff, there's no way of sense buts. This does not lie. It just reports pressure over time. Um, anyways, I just thought I wanted to pass that along and hopefully uh, you guys learned some stuff and hopefully you find this interesting and we'll catch you on the next one.